also we just want to lift up these many requests. There are so many that have been mentioned, so many in our church family, so many of our church family that have friends or probably acquaintances, friends, family that are dealing with certain things going on, have had tragedy occur or face some surgery. Um, we may not know every detail, but you do. And we trust you, Father, because you are the great physician. You are an almighty, powerful God. And we just pray uh, for healing, for um, that comfort, that whoever needs it, Father, we pray for that tonight. And also, we just pray for our study as we continue to go through. Pray as we take a closer look at the work of the Holy Spirit in our lives and how we see how he operates throughout the biblical text and also just through out history and father we also pray for our church pray that we can continuously be a lighthouse in this community of the hope that's found in jesus and father also we just uh want to lift up awana tonight and all the kiddos that are over there just pray for all the workers everything that's going on and we once again thank you so much for jesus thank you for salvation and we ask all this in his name amen amen well we're continuing our study here uh, this evening, I'm talking about the Holy Spirit, and our topic tonight is going to be sinning against the Holy Spirit. Sinning against the Holy Spirit. Uh, how important, this is a question for you, how important is it to keep a campfire going when you're camping or if you're hiking along a trail? How important is that to have a campfire? How important do you think it is? Anybody ever been camping or hiking? You know how important it is? Oh, it's very important. Well, the lesson tonight that we're going to be describing and talking about sinning against the Holy Spirit is about quenching the Spirit, which we know that the Spirit can be quenched in many aspects of our life. We want to examine that this evening. And it's important that we fan the flames of the Spirit's ministry in our hearts, that we never allow the Spirit to be quenched, that we continuously strive for the Holy Spirit to be active, to be relevant in our lives and every aspect of our lives so that he can guide us, direct us, and equip us for uh, what we need. Now, if you were stranded in the wilderness, if you were stranded in the wilderness for one week, what tool would you want to have with you that is very important? What tool would you like to have? Cigarette lighter, okay. Jar of peanut butter. <laughs> What's something else? A gun, that's a good one, that's a good one. Anything else you can think of? A hatchet, okay. Proper clothing, absolutely. Bug spray. <laughs> I phoned to call McDonald's. <laughs> if you get some internet reception, maybe you can call um, Grubhub or something. They can GPS you and bring you the food you need. <laughs> then they can escort you right out once they find you. <laughs> but often those who are stranded in the wilderness, and I've heard stories before, of people who have been lost. And the, I've, I've read stories of just throughout history of people that have been lost due to some type of circumstance. And the reason why many of them can survive is because they do have something on them that can start a fire. And a fire does so much. Um, it can start, um, you can start a fire to boil water for, for drinking or for getting you ready to cook any type of animal that you can fine whether it be you you kill a squirrel or you just find something I mean you're going to eat if your life's in jeopardy and the fire also keeps them if it's cold from hypothermia there's so much that a fire will do to keep you safe to keep you warm while you're in the wilderness also it scares away predators having that fire will keep them away um, so there's so much that can be done but tonight we're going to be looking at sins against the Holy Spirit. And the first two that we're going to be talking about are actually for unbelievers. And then the last three are going to be for us as believers. So there's going to be five different things we're going to speak of here 
But the first two are for unbelievers, and the last three are for believers. Well, the first one that we're going to look at, and this is one that you've probably heard of and maybe have thought of, and maybe you've been misinformed about what this means and have heard it, but is blaspheming the Spirit. Now, this comes from a passage in Matthew chapter 12, verses 22, verse number 32. And uh, I'm not going to read the whole passage to you, but this speaks of the so-called unpardonable sin. You ever heard someone just throw that out saying there's an unpardonable sin that is being committed and because of this it's just something that cannot be forgiven. Now the interpretation of this passage actually uh, is it varies widely. Um, some of the people that I've read before, some of the thoughts that go into this are sometimes erroneous, sometimes it can be damaging and that's why I say it's very important that when you sit down and you have a book, whether it be a commentary or just a book you're reading, to know who you are reading. Uh, because whoever it is, their thought process, their theological basis, their platform upon which they go from is going to outline what they put in this text, okay? That's just like when you listen to people on the radio or TV um, preachers. If they believe a certain way, don't expect them to believe and say something that you believe and you know is right and they don't think is right, but you know is right. Don't, don't sit there and expect them to say something that's right. So it's important for us to rightly divide the word of truth and also to hold whatever someone says under scrutiny. And what should hold it under scrutiny? The word of God. If what they say does not align with the Word of God, trash it, okay? Do away with it. Have nothing to do with it whatsoever. So there's a lot of text and commentaries today that are um, not correct, and they're damaging with what they say and can mislead. So that's something to keep in mind. It's also important to understand both the correct context and the characteristics of the sin. So we are equipped to help those who are worried they might have committed the unpardonable sin. There's some people that believe that they've committed this unpardonable sin, and because of that, they cannot be saved. Now, that's a lot of misleading, and also just not having enough information to know what is true. So we're going to look at this tonight, and look at how this applies to unbelievers. So let's look at this text, and I'm just going to kind of outline. I'm not going to read it, but I'm going to kind of summarize it, save us on some time. So the context of the sin is, the impartable sin is simply blasphemy against the Holy Spirit. Now, Jesus' warning about blaspheming the Spirit came after, now this is a biblical passage, he had healed a blind and mute man by casting the demon out of him. This is Matthew chapter number 12. Now, the wonderful demonstration that he displayed by his power caused the people to confess that Christ was the son of David. They were saying that. They were confessing that he was the son of David. Now, the people's bold declaration by saying this, their bold declaration brought an immediate effort by the who? The Pharisees, that well-known crowd that does nothing but try to do Jesus in, they brought this bold declaration, so there's an immediate effort by the Pharisees to discredit Christ. They asserted, now this is something to pick up on, they asserted that Christ was in a league with Satan, that he was in cahoots with Satan, and that Satan was withdrawing demons from people at Jesus' request. That's what they were stating. So Christ then answers that it would be foolish for Satan to destroy his own kingdom. Why would Satan use me to do something good? So that's what Jesus is saying here. So then, and he says, Also others cast out demons, but had not been accused of collaboration with Satan. And what it all boiled down to is they just did not like Jesus. They wanted him done away with. They wanted him to just be hushed and him to go away. Okay, that's what they wanted. So, Jesus then declares that the only conceivable, the only conceivable explanation for what they saw as the fact that the kingdom of God had come to them and that he was the representative. 
He is the one. He is the Messiah. So in making this statement, Christ explained that he cast out demons by, and this is what it says in Matthew 12, verse number 28, the Spirit of God. This is how it happened, that he was able to cast them out. But if I cast out devils by the Spirit of God, then the kingdom of God has come unto you, it says in verse number 28. So having confounded his critics, Christ then issues a solemn warning. And this goes to the Pharisees. The Pharisees had committed a grievous sin. A very grievous one. When he called blasphemy against the Holy Ghost. Let's look what it says here in verses 31 through 32. Wherefore I say unto you, all manner of sin and blasphemy shall be forgiven unto men, but the blasphemy against the Holy Ghost shall not be forgiven unto men. And whosoever speaketh a word against the Son of Man, it shall be forgiven him, but whosoever speaketh against the Holy Ghost, it shall not be forgiven him, neither in this world, neither in the world to come. Now, what makes blasphemy against the Spirit such a serious sin? He just said it here in this verse. What did he say? It's not forgivable. Jesus said that it is a sin that would not be forgiven in this or in the one to come. Meaning that it's unforgivable. Okay? Now, let's look at the character of the sin. This is the next thing we're going to look at. Now, with this context in mind, this passage that we've just read, this one we're addressing here with the blasphemy of the Holy Spirit, let's consider the sin which the Pharisees committed on that occasion. Now, Christ's words show us the sin had three distinct characteristics and that the sin could not possibly be repeated today. Okay? Now, we'll get into that just a little bit more here in a few moments. Now, first of all, we're going to look at the sin was against a divine person. Now, by deriding Christ's ministry... By what the Pharisees were doing, the Pharisees were guilty of speaking against the Holy Ghost. And this is what we're told here in Matthew 12, verse number 32. They were dull in their spiritual understanding and did not recognize the work of the Holy Spirit through the Messiah, even though they were familiar with the Old Testament text. They were familiar with that and with familiar with what it said about the Holy Spirit to be God. So they were sinning against God when they spoke against the work of the Holy Spirit. Whether they realized it or not, or they were just dull in their understanding, they were sinning against God by going against and blaspheming the Holy Spirit that we see here in this passage. But also, secondly, the sin had a definite situation. Now, many people have been frightened by messages from Matthew 12. Why do you think that is? It's because they think that they can do something that is unforgivable. That's what it is. And many have preached that. Saying that if you do this, there's something that's unforgivable. Well, tell me what it is. There's nothing that is unforgivable except for the fact of a rejection of Jesus. If you reject Jesus then you're going to hell. But if you accept him, you're going to heaven. But there's no sin that we can commit in this life that is unpardonable. There's not. Now, within this context, we're going to talk about how this applied to the Pharisees just here in a moment. They feel as if, this is what some people feel today, as if they have committed this unpardonable sin and that it is therefore useless for them to ever hope for salvation. Did you know that there's many people that walk into churches on Sundays and they feel like that, that I've done something so bad I can't be forgiven. I've heard people say that before. You just don't know what I've done. You don't know the sin that I committed. I guarantee you you haven't sinned like the Apostle Paul did. He said, I am chief of sinners. I'm the chief. You haven't sinned like I've sinned. So regardless of what you've done, 
regardless of what mishaps, what mistakes you've made, there's always grace. Man, isn't that wonderful to know? There's always grace and forgiveness, and that's beautiful to know. Now, while it is true that people do resist the Spirit of God in this age that we walk here, by doing so, they are not guilty of the sin for which Jesus condemned the Pharisees. The sin to which our Lord referred, now this is what I'm getting to because these are two different times, two different ages. The sin to which our Lord referred to was a sin committed during Christ's physical presence on this earth. The specific sin consisted of attributing the miracles of Christ to Satan. So what the Pharisees were doing is that Jesus, this man that's standing here before you, he's doing the works of Satan. And in doing so, he was blaspheming. They were blaspheming the Holy Spirit. Now, this is impossible for anybody to commit this sin today because Christ is not physically present with us. So there's a huge distinction here, okay? Christ is not physically present with us here. We don't see the miracles today like Jesus performed and what he did. But during this age, he was there, and they were basically right in front of his face calling him that he was a worker of iniquity. He was a worker of Satan. So that's what they were doing. Now it's not, and this is what we were talking about earlier, it is not the sin of rejecting the gospel which is a sin committed by people today. This is not what we're talking about. This is a different time and this is a different context of what Jesus is speaking here about blasphemy of the Holy Spirit. Now, number three, the sin had a dire consequence. I've heard it said many times before, sin is always more serious than people realize. And did you know, too, sin will always cost you more than you ever dreamed you were going to pay. It always does. Sin has a price tag. It was a price that you or I couldn't pay. But I'm thankful for one that had enough to pay it all. And uh, that's wonderful to know. But the Pharisee's sin of blasphemy against the Holy Spirit was serious indeed. In the full blaze of divine revelation in the person of Christ, they deliberately turned their backs and refused to receive him. That's what they did. We're not going to accept you. You are saying that you are God, that you're the son of David. Well, to them, that was just crazy. What are you saying? Such a sin shall not be forgiven unto men. This is what it says in Matthew 12, number 3. The concluding words of the Lord, neither in the world to come, teach that the decisions made in this life determine eternal destiny. And when we think about it too, the decisions that we make in this life determine our eternal destiny. I mean, a decision of whether to trust Jesus or not to trust him. That, but that's left up to us. So first of all, we see this within the passage of blaspheming the Spirit. And then number two is resisting the Spirit. This comes into a passage of of Stephen. Let's go to Acts chapter 6, verse number 8. And we're going to see how the Spirit spoke. And Stephen, full of faith and power, did great wonders and miracles among the people. Well, what was Stephen doing in the church? Very obviously, miracles among the people. He was a devoted follower of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. He was a devoted Christian. Um, Also, let's read verses 9 through 11. Then there arose certain of the synagogue, which is called the synagogue of the Libertines, and the Cyrenians and Alexandrians, out of them of Cilicia and of Asia, disputing with Stephen. And they were not able to resist the wisdom and the spirit by which he spake. Then they, st- they suburbed men which said, We have heard him speak blasphemous words against Moses and against God. And then chapter 7, verse number 1. Then said the high priest, Are these things so? So what accusation, or what accusation was made against him? That he spoke against Moses and against God. Now, Through Stephen, we know Stephen is a devout follower of Christ. He is also known as the first martyr, Stephen, who gave his life. And God 
Through Stephen, God warned Israel and the religious leaders in Acts chapter number 7. If you read that entire chapter, you'll see where he warned them and the religious leaders. So Stephen reminded them of the glorious history of the sons of Abraham and how God had worked in mighty power on their behalf. Uh, He particularly called to their minds the words of God, Acts 7, verse number 37, Um, Israel rejected the prophets God sent them. Remember in the Old Testament, there's passages where we read that they spoke to the people of Israel, but they rejected because of their hardness of their hearts. And when the Messiah, the just one, came... Now, a lot of the reasons behind them rejecting Jesus was because when they thought the Messiah was coming, they were looking for a a, a politically military just person that was going to wipe out and take care of things. That's what they were looking for. But when they saw this man come, Jesus, and he started preaching these things and teaching these things, they thought, that's not what we want. And the Bible even tells us he came and dwelt with his own and they rejected him. They didn't want anything to do with him. So when the Messiah, the just one, came, Israel betrayed and murdered him. This is what's told in Acts 7, verse number 52. Now, Israel was responsible to hear and obey the word of God, but they failed to keep it instead. And that's what finishes out there, verse number 53, just kind of a little summation of that entire chapter. But the Spirit spoke, and this is what Stephen's talking about. Then the Spirit spurned. Now, uh, Stephen's hearers, and especially the religious leaders, reacted violently to his message. Why would they have reacted violently? They didn't like what he had to say. I mean, oftentimes when you get up and you speak the truth and you're in a crowd where it's divided or maybe there's more that lean the other way than there is the good way, people are going to get a little violent. I've seen some videos of people that have gone out and read Scripture and people get up in their face and blatantly just say obscenities to them. Why is that? Because they don't like hearing it. It's either they disagree with it or they know it's true, they just don't want to hear the truth. Okay? So here, Stephen's hearers, and especially the religious leaders, reacted violently to his message. All their actions confirmed the truth of his indictment against them. And this is what it said in Acts 7, verse number 51. Ye stiff-necked and uncircumcised in heart and ears... Ye do always resist the Holy Ghost. That's what he told them. He said, you're resisting. And why? And what happened as a result of that? They had him killed eventually. The relig- he had him, had him killed. All right, so we looked at these first two here. And this is talking about unbelievers. Let's look at these last three, and this talks about how that we can grieve the Spirit as believers. Number three, and we've talked about this a little bit, I think, so this will be a little bit of a review about what we went through with the early church, but lying to the Spirit. Lying to the Spirit. Now, God displayed His power and presence in the early churches how he operated, how he set things up, how he put people in place, how people went out and operated, how the early church in the very beginning met in secret, in caves, and oftentimes met like that because of the Roman government. They had to meet like that. But here we see the practice of pretense. And this is coming to a passage that we've talked about maybe once or twice already, but it's interesting it went back through this study again, and it's a great example, and and we'll just look at it again here, is Ananias and Sapphira. Well, we know this story. If you remember back, you should know this well. You should know this quite well. But they were evidently impressed by the generosity displayed by Barnabas. Um, Many people think that. He brought a substantial gift to the Lord in Acts 4, verses 34 through 37. So they decided to bring a gift too. They said, well, if he's going to do it, we're going to do it also. We're going to bring a gift also. So they did, and they did, though, however, for an entirely different reason, not a good reason. So Ananias and Sapphira lied to the Holy Spirit. What was the lie? 
It was the spirit of pretense, a hoax, is what it was. And this does not stop just with them, but it still occurs today also. And you have to be careful about that. Tennessee game, Saturday. Well, there's a bunch of people I saw praying. I wonder if they're saying, Lord, if you'll let that ball go through that, between them posts, I'll be in church. How many of them were in church? I mean, and sometimes we think, I've never prayed for a result of a game. Hopefully you haven't either, because that would just be, I think it's an insult to the Lord, really. It is, to do something like that. Eternity is in the balance of so many people dying and going to hell, and we're praying for a ball to go through two poles. I mean, now, I'm sure they were glad they won, but seriously, I wonder how many of those people were at church the next day. I guarantee you, probably not many of them. But this still happens today. People will make promises to the Lord. They'll say they'll do this, they'll do that. And you know what it is? It's just a big hoax is what it is. People will come often to church, and then they'll come for a little bit, and then they'll disappear. And you know why? Because they're looking for an answer. Things are going bad. Things get good. They disappear. You know why? Because they're looking for a quick fix. And when things are good, God will be there the next time. Whenever I'm having a hardship, I'll go right back to the church again, get that lift me up and go back out. But I think, once again, that's grieving the Holy Spirit. You cannot live a faithful walk with the Lord living like that. I don't see how you can. And so we see here that it was a spiritual um, pretense um, what are the things we might do today to impress people with our spirituality? What do you think? Oh, quoting scripture. Have you heard somebody pray before? And I don't know, I, I'm not the best prayer person in the world, like public prayer. Um, I, I'm just not. I've heard some people that have laid down some good prayers and I believe are very genuine. But I remember going somewhere, hearing a sermon sometime, and this guy actually got to preaching in his sermon, or in his prayer. And I was like, should we open our eyes or keep our eyes closed? <laughs> I was like, what's going on here? But um, I just think sometimes we can do that. We can quote scripture. We can really show our intellect, how, how smart we are. And, but sometimes that can honestly be a pretense because you do know that Satan knows his stuff too. Satan knows the word. You know how I know he knows it? It's because he tried to use it against Jesus. Even though he knew that he wasn't going to win. I really believe he knew he wasn't going to win. But he was going to try. And here we see that oftentimes we have many, many today in churches. Many today that come on TV. Many today that write books. That are wolves in sheep's clothing. And... Oftentimes, they'll show that they know a lot, but you know it's just a big hoax. That's what it is. I'll never forget, hopefully you don't know who this is, but there was a church in Lenore City, and I remember years ago, it'd come on the same day, he and his wife would have this little water, and they'd say, if you send in your money, I'll send you this water, and if you drink it, all your problems will just poof, be gone. If you send us this money and get this water, if you drink that, all your pain, all your sickness, poof, will be gone. And he was getting that same water out of the same tap that we do. It's a hoax. It's a hoax. These people that stand up at these conventions, Benny Hinn, I'll say it, Benny Hinn, Benny Hinn that would go up and lay people back and say he was going to heal them, it's a hoax. If it was real, why would you charge? And why wouldn't you go to every hospital all across this world healing them all? Why ask them to come to you when you can go to them? It's a hoax. And so we have to know that it's a serious thing to lie to the Holy Spirit. And so Ananias and Sapphira did this. And guess what? As a result, you know how serious it was? The Lord dropped them on their backs because they lied. 
Do you know why he made an example out of them? It was for the early church to know he meant business. And it was to help establish the health and continuity of the church moving forward. That's why he did that. Now, why do we do such things sometimes when people do this? And what results are we hoping for? Well, we want the glory without the sacrifice. That's what oftentimes people do when they get to college and they'll get to a class. They want the degree, but they don't want to do the work. But you got to do the work to get the degree. I mean, I found that out too. When I was in college, I, I met a reality that I had to really assert myself and do. And, and even when I was in seminary, I wrote so many papers and I had to really dedicate myself to doing that because if you don't do the work, you're not going to get the results. And so oftentimes people want the glory without the sacrifice. And in order for us to be who we need to be for the Lord, it takes sacrifice. It does. Because Jesus never promised an easy road. No way. No how. It's sacrifice. That's why Romans tells us, to present ourselves a living sacrifice. That's what we need to do. Okay? Now, what are some indications that a person takes lying the Holy Spirit seriously enough to seek to live an honest life before God? I think it's a well-ordered life. I think it's daily communion with the Lord. And one big thing is if they do something in the church and they do a lot of work, they don't seek the applause of others. I think that's a well good indicator. I mean, I've seen over the years somebody do something and if somebody didn't come over and make a stumble on stage and applaud them and give them a medal and give them a big bouquet and just say, oh man, whoa, that was a good job. They're upset. Who are you doing it for? Them or the Lord? You're doing it for the Lord. And if you're doing it for the Lord, who cares what all the others think? Okay, so that's a well good indicator of someone that's living an honest life before the Lord. But here it is saying lying to the Spirit. But also the price of pretense. We actually got a little ahead of ourselves here. But the startling results was that Ananias and Sapphira both were struck dead. This is Acts 5, verse number 5 and verse number 10. And a uh, question here is from Acts 5, 11. And great fear came upon the church and upon as many as heard these things. And a question here, it's, it's evident here in the Scripture. How did the early church respond to God's judgment? A great fear. I don't think they were, may, maybe, maybe if they weren't living right, maybe they were scared, like, is God going to take me next? And who knows? We don't know. We just know scripturally here. Maybe there were some others that this happened to. But I think this fear was a fear of reverence and of respect. And that's something that we need more of today, is a fear and a reverence for God. We need that more. All right, let's move to the next one here. Number four is quenching the Spirit. Um, 1 Thessalonians 5.19. Quench not the Spirit. This is Paul writing to the church of Thessalonica. And what happens when a fire is quenched? It ceases to have power or influence. Now, if you're like me, I've been at a campfire before, and I see those little embers and and I love it when the fire's good. Boy, it feels good. And, and uh, you just hope that smoke, the wind's blowing, it blows the other way. Because I don't like it blowing toward me, but I like the heat. And so when the heat is good and then you finally see it going down, 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 it's up to you to get up and poke that fire or to do something to increase the flame. Because it's not going to give off the heat. It's not going to be as powerful as it once was. And it's the same with us, with the Holy Spirit living within inside of us. We cannot quench that flame. And there's several things that we can do that do that. Uh, the word quench portrays the Holy Spirit as a fire, if you look at the original language. A burning force, a motivating person who seeks to direct the believer towards certain goals and actions. To quench the Spirit is to douse that fire. And obviously there's many Christians that 
have their spirit quenched. It's not burning very well at all or at all. Um, the context of 1 Thessalonians chapter 5 indicates some areas of the believer's life in which the spirit may be quenched. It is possible, for instance, to stifle him in the matter of praise. Now, 1 Thessalonians 5.16, in this context we're looking at here, we are told to rejoice evermore. Now, to refuse or neglect rejoicing and praise to God is a sin which we're all often guilty of. We tend to concentrate, instead of rejoicing at all times, on what? The problems that are at hand. Don't we? Disappointments rather than the victories and blessings. We oftentimes focus on the bad instead of the good, and it overshadows those. That can really quench the spirit. Also, it's possible to quench with regard to prayer. First Thessalonians 5.17, we're to pray without ceasing. Hmm. Also, believers may also quench the Spirit by disobeying God's revealed will. Paul also said in 1 Thessalonians 5.20, he says, despise not these prophesyings. Now we know the gift of prophecy is not relevant for the church today because that ceased in the apostolic age. However, you could also use this same example if the word is presented to you by the speaker, the man of God that's standing before you, and you refuse it, you quench the spirit. Because you've heard the truth, you know what to do, but you chose not to do it. So that's quenching um, as well. So what are some warning signs that the spirit's fire has gone out in a believer? What's some warning signs? Lost their joy. That's a good one. Lost their peace. Yeah. 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 Absolutely. That's the only way we can have access to the Father anyways is through Jesus. He's our mediator. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. And that's going to lead into our next one as well. Um, number five, and we'll hopefully we'll get this one over too. It's grieving the Spirit. Let's read Ephesians four seventeen through 18. This I say, therefore, then testify in the Lord that ye henceforth walk not as other Gentiles walk in the vanity of their mind, having the understanding darkened, being alienated from the life of God through the ignorance that is in them because of the blindness of their heart. Now, the unsaved have their understanding darkened and is blind in their heart to the truth about God because a person that is not saved does not have the same connection that we do to the Father because we do have that personal relationships. And it's no surprise that the unbeliever lives as if God does not exist. That's why you see many today that state there is no God, atheist, agnostic, whoever it is, they'll state that in their defense. But it makes no sense for a believer, however, to live that way. A believer shouldn't live like that. Ephesians 4.30 um, tells us, we'll look at this verse, and grieve not the Holy Spirit of God, whereby ye are sealed unto the day of redemption. Now, what will believers do to the indwelling Holy Spirit if they persist in living as they did before they were saved? Grieve Him. That's what they'll do. Um, now, I'm not going to read all these here. I've got Ephesians 4, 20 through 32. But these are a list of sins that possibly could grieve the Holy Spirit. And uh, the sin of bitterness is possibly one that is huge. Bitterness, I'm just going to tell you, because I've talked to so many people about it. I've dealt with my own family on it. Bitterness will be the end of you if you allow it. It will ruin you. And I think that if we have bitterness in our hearts and we carry it with us, we are continuously grieving the Holy Spirit. We are. Uh, bitterness comes to us when feelings have been stepped on 
And some of us, it's like we've walked. You ever, you ever heard that old saying, people just walk with a chip on their shoulder waiting to get it knocked off? I, I literally think that many people are like that. And if you, if you were to take and you did the blow on that chip, it'd blow off. I mean, it's just there's, there's people that are sometimes like that. But believers should guard their heart against a bitter heart. Guard yourself against that bitterness. What is in our hearts will express itself through our lips. And like one pastor told me once before, he said, what's in the well will come up in the bucket. So we must, we must guard our hearts. Um, A number of sins mentioned by Paul in Ephesians 4 are sins of the tongue. And Paul named lying, uh, corrupt communication, glamour, clamor, and evil speaking. And it's so easy to sin with our lips. We talked about this when we were going through James. It's so easy for us to say things, hurtful things, do things that uh, ugly rumors and gossip and just slander. Oh man, we can just let that tongue just twirl and go out of control. And that's why we have to tame the tongue and have a control over what we say. And we know from Proverbs chapter 6, uh, the six things doth the Lord hate. And one of those is that he, so- he that soweth discord among the brethren. And that means that you're grieving the spirit if a person's in the church. And they're everywhere. I think, I, I, hopefully nothing here, but I will say it's probably in every church you have somebody that likes to sow discord that has nothing really good to say. And the thing is, you're constantly grieving the spirit when you're striving to do that. So that's something that we must keep in mind um, because six things the Lord hates. If you want to find them, they're in Proverbs chapter 6. But one of them is speaking evil and doing discord. So that can grieve the spirit. All right, we got one minute left. Anybody got anything they want to share from that? But tonight is about bringing blasphemy um, in our lives and how that we can quench the spirit and obviously we read from the context of the passage the blasphemy of the spirit with how the pharisees were doing that to jesus but does anybody have anything that kind of spoke to them tonight i've enjoyed this study because it's made me think a lot more about the holy spirit i just don't think we talk about him enough um, and understand how blessed we are to have one that walks with us every day that gives us what we need, and, and we're sealed with him, and we have him living with inside of us, that power that comes through what he gives us each and every day. It's really neat to know. hmm Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And that's oftentimes what people hear, and there's a confusion between what we just talked about tonight blaspheming the Holy Ghost and then the unpardonable aspect and for us it's rejection of the gospel i mean but there's nothing that we can do in this life that god will look upon us and say that's not forgivable i mean nothing i mean even for the person that tonight is in prison sitting behind bars that has committed murder if they're lost and a man or a woman goes in and shares or gives their testimony and that man really genuinely gives his heart to Christ, he's forgiven. It doesn't matter what anybody's done. I mean, I know this is kind of crazy to think about, but even like the terrorist attacks, that was bad. But if one of those terrorists would have repented, gave their heart to Christ and was genuine, they'd be forgiven. And that's hard for us to think because we think, well, they get what they deserve. But what about us? Yeah. 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 
Yes, absolutely. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah, it's just like the man I was sharing about, and I don't know of a man. I'm just giving that as an example. He's still going to have to do his time and, according to the laws of the land, may have to face the death penalty. Yes, absolutely, and he would be forgiven spiritually. Yeah, so, good deal. Yeah. 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 And that's a clear evidence if someone does something then they don't feel guilty about it. That's a clear indicator that their flame is almost to the point of being out. Because if your flame was burning brightly, I know I've made mistakes before, and it's really brought me to the point of saying, Lord, i got to get this right, whether it was with somebody. It just eat me and eat me. And I, I'm just the type of person, I like to get things worked out. I don't like there to be any type of who doing or whatever is going on between who and whoever. But, so, but yeah, that's true. All right, been good to be here tonight. We went a little, little over tonight. Walt won't charge me too much. So. <laughs> I'm just kidding. Oh, awesome. Awesome. That's wonderful. Great. That's awesome. I like to hear that good. That's that's excellent news because we know that one is saved, that there's a party in heaven. The angels rejoice. Yeah. So Amen. Well, let's go ahead and we'll dismiss in a word of prayer. And uh, Max, would you pray for us, brother?